So I'd like to welcome everyone to Gary and Sir Maelia Foundation's presentation with Dr. Barth Green. And we go way back too many years. Um, Dr. Green was definitely one of the pioneers in the early years of this um, to help shine a light when there certainly were not many lights shining on it. And he's helped so many people and we're very grateful that he's part of our board and he continues to uh, support research down here and work with patient groups, which is really important that they, they understand and know that research is going forward, um, that things are progressing, and that there's hope at the ultimate end for everyone. And hopefully, you know, in my life, I hope we see um, something for neuropathic pain that really works, and uh, maybe a cure. And I'm sure Dr. Green is going to be one of those people that pushes us to that end. So please welcome Dr. Green. when people talk, use the words, you know, lifetime and uh, pioneer and <laughs> I need to weep a few minutes here, but I'll get over it. <laughs> Luckily, I have a little chocolate rush from the cookie, but I appreciate you coming here. Behind you and around you are some of my teammates who are um, neurosurgeons and researchers and some in training, some professors and people that support me administratively, and, and uh, I guess they were curious to see if the old guy still has it and he can talk. I'm not sure. Anyway, appreciate you coming here. So I, I've been involved with, uh, with Chiari and Sringo Maelia for many years, and uh, prior to the imaging revolution, what we call the renaissance in imaging of the nervous system, we had very little understanding of this disease. And so it's been an extraordinary uh, journey um, as a physician and surgeon treating patients with uh, this entity. We know now that what we thought were a few exceptional patients um, with genetic syndromes, that probably there is a, a preponderance of genetic issues that uh, ultimately relate in the creation of a of a Chiari malformation. And we know that um, this is something that some people are born with and die with and are never aware that they have a Chiari malformation or syringomyelia. And a lot of people who come in my office say, oh my gosh, I'm just clumsy. I've been clumsy my whole life. And they're in their 60s or 70s and they have this huge syrinx and you just wonder if they sneeze if they're gonna collapse but people do adapt and uh, accommodate. So Chiari malformation itself is something that needs to be discussed over many hours and many sessions. Syringomyelia can be uh, present with or, without, with or without Chiari malformation, and there's differences in types of Chiaris. There's differences in a childhood disease uh, associated with myelomeningocele, and hydrocephalus versus the adult, what we say the adult form of Chiari uh, that presents usually in people much older, uh, most often, but not always. And uh, often there's an event that has nothing to do with their Chiari that precipitates their symptoms. Uh, a minor trauma, a fall, a bad uh, pneumonia or coughing spell that begins a uh, cascade of signs and symptoms that are so numerous, you could fill this auditorium with different signs and symptoms. And probably the biggest uh, enemy of people like myself who try and focus on effective treatments is the internet. Because if you read the internet information, often you see that there are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of signs and symptoms people have related to Chiari, but people have more than one problem very often. And having Chiari doesn't immunize you against diabetes or against Parkinson's disease 
or against other neurological disorders or, or neuropathies or cardiac disorders or diabetes and all the other diseases. So this just adds to the complexity. So I've taken one small area of this very large uh, body of information, some scientific, some just common knowledge or misknowledge, misinformation, and I've tried to focus on one of the most significant challenges that Chiari malformation and syringomyelia patients face. And the combination of Chiari 1 with syringomyelia definitely presents a different group of signs and symptoms and different challenges as far as management of quality of life issues like pain and spasms and, and other issues that uh, are not necessarily experienced by people with pure Chiari's. And I'll also qualify it further and say that very often, because of the skeletal imbalance that occurs with Chiari, what happens is that people are affected in their spinal alignment and their stability. Often they overstretch or they can even have a syndrome you've heard about, uh, a Lordano syndrome where there is laxity of the ligaments, exacerbated by manipulations and other things in yoga. And so often these people have two separate but related conditions. So as I go through this quickly, uh, I'm going to give you an overview of how we approach patients who present with these signs and symptoms. And I'll preface my remarks by saying even though I'm a surgeon, uh, the best surgery most often is no surgery. But if you are going to do surgery, it should be very carefully planned out and it should be planned to be the only operation that someone needs. So you have to look holistically at all the other issues, whether it's invagination of the spine into the skull, basilar vagination, whether it's hypermobility or instability, whether there's other malformations or cord tethering below that can affect the strategy for surgery and the primary treatment. And everybody knows that any surgery you do it's better to do it right the first time and not have to do what we call salvage uh, or revision surgery. So I'm gonna go through this and you can feel free to stop me at any time if you have a question. The only issue I'll tell you is that I, being a senior citizen, if you stop me, I'll have to start at the beginning. Because <laughs> I don't want this to get any of you to hold back, okay? So here's where we are. This is one of the largest and busiest medical centers in the world, not just this country. There's 25,000 people working within a square mile, so it's quite a large area of concentration of medical. We also have a justice system that's centered here just across the street uh, where we are able to send our misbehaving physicians. No, that's not <laughs> but, but it is in the same uh, downtown inner city complex, which has been my neighborhood now for 38 years. Um, this is the Lois Pope Life Center you're sitting in, which is the home of the Miami Project, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, neuroscience uh, research center um, in the nation and maybe in the world, but it focuses on, um, on basic uh, knowledge, creating new knowledge, and translating that knowledge into clinical treatments. And uh, it's a very exciting place, and those of you who are from Miami uh, or nearby, uh, it's open for tours by a very outstanding member of our team, and she's a PhD scientist and a great communicator, and almost every day she takes groups of people who are interested in what we're doing up into the laboratories and into the clinical research areas explain what the neuroscience is. So, we're here today to talk about pain, and there's a lot of uh, definitions, but everybody agrees it's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience because you can't have pain without an emotional reaction. It's the same nervous system, and that's how we react to this damage or injury or insult. Um, it's very important to understand the difference between what's called nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. 
And unfortunately, most of our pain doctors, specialists in pain management, don't necessarily know the difference. So medications like morphine and opiates and all types of very addictive uh, medications are given for neuropathic pain when they have no really effect except to addict and depress and, and uh, really uh, incapacitate the patients. Um, they're not effective in neuropathic pain, which is the pain that's associated with Chiari and Syringomyelia. So nociceptive is everything from a toothache, from breaking your arm or bruising yourself or, or having a regular headache. You know, so it's very important to be able to know the difference between pain that's associated with the nervous system or pain that's associated with other organ systems that are responsive to different, totally different approaches and treatments. So it's a protective pain that you feel when someone steps on your toe or when you have a, a, a toothache or when someone gets injured in an accident and you crack your ribs or bruise them. Um, this is a different type of pain and it's associated with a lot of disease processes that are normal such as you know rheumatoid arthritis and, and different types of inflammatory conditions and it's much different than neuropathic pain. And these types of pain, the nociceptive, are very effectively treated in most cases with common uh, non-narcotic analgesics uh, and in some cases anti-inflammatories ranging from uh, steroids to non-steroidals and other types of medications that don't have the side effects of the more addicting uh, and, and uh, depressing uh, and uh, narcotics we spoke about earlier. So it's very important when you talk about pain to tell the difference. If you ask anybody about neuropathic pain, um, it's very important to realize it's a rainbow, a myriad of signs and symptoms and different descriptions. I remember when I was a young student of neurosurgery, there was a very famous neurosurgeon that was paralyzed. He had a tumor and had surgery, and he developed this terrible pain in the lower half of his body. And he described it for the first time to my colleagues. He said he felt like he was always sitting on a beach ball. And he felt like someone was taking a match and, and rolling it back and forth under his lower half of his body, his legs, his butt, and his genitalia. And that this was what he felt every day of his life. And I think a lot of us in my profession for the first time had a real uh, insight into what people were experiencing uh, with this type of pain. And by the way, everybody who's paralyzed doesn't have neuropathic pain. Everybody with a spinal cord cyst or sphingomyelia doesn't have neuropathic pain. And all Chiaris don't have neuropathic pain. And some of each of those groups have a combination of neuropathic and nociceptive pain. So it's important to know the difference. Neuropathic pain usually starts at the level of injury or compromise of the nervous system and it can be very local. It can be what we call below the level and it, it can be diffuse. It can involve, for example, in syringomyelia, it can involve the entire body below and it can affect some fibers that descend from the brain like trigeminal tract and go up into the face. Even though it's nowhere near the head, you still can experience facial pain. So there are things that we need to know about that, makes us, that may, helps us understand what people are describing. Um, and there's also other conditions that have, are associated with pain, inflammatory conditions. And um, it's very important to understand these. Uh, fibromyalgia, polymyositis, are sort of catch-all terms that people are told when the doctor most often doesn't know what's going on and they just sort of say, oh, you've got fibromyalgia, you know, and, and, and there is such a condition. But there are laboratory markers and there's clinical criteria that make this real, but most often people, it's just a simple way to sort of tell people, go away and take some medicine. So uh, cancer has a very unique group of, of signs and symptoms, pain associated with cancer. 
that can be from the nervous system being involved directly by tumors or being damaged by the effects of tumor or being damaged by the effects of radiation therapy or being damaged by the effects of chemotherapy. And each of those entities can result in cancer patients experiencing very similar types of neuropathic pain as one would with syringomyelia and in certain cases of Chiari malformation. So it's very important to be open-minded, to be listening to what people describe and try and separate and categorize the cause of pain because each type of neuropathic pain has certain treatments which are more successful even though you just heard Dorothy uh, mention that boy, I hope someday we have a cure for neuropathic pain. The truth is we don't have a cure uh, right now for syringomyelia or neuropathic pain but we have more effective treatments than we ever have before. So that's a good thing. And there's more researchers, some in the audience now, who are studying the uh, cause and, and treatment of Chiari and syringomyelia uh, and are very committed to finding better treatments and hopefully, ultimately, uh, through the tremendous uh, focus on genetics and other preventive medicine, uh, there will be a, a prevention as well as effective treatments. So acute pain, uh, you've all heard of uh, fight or flight. People who have, you see the pictures of people's hair standing up um, when they're scared and they breathe faster, the heart goes faster, um, their blood pressure goes up, and this is a normal response and it, to an injury uh, or even a scary situation. Chronic pain is, is a whole different ballgame. And as you know, it's an industry in this country, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars, you know. No one has any idea exactly worldwide what the cost is, but in this country, and especially in Florida, it's a thriving industry where for a while, you know, everybody used to say in Dublin or on every street there was a pub and a church. And in, in South Florida, especially Fort Lauderdale was the most famous on every street there was a public church and a pain clinic. And uh, a lot of those have been closed down recently for dispensing millions of, of narcotic prescriptions without ever seeing or touching a patient. And this created a whole generation of drug dependent, especially young people or injured workers, and has had a devastating effect on our economy, not to mention the crime uh, that plagues our society and, and the violence, especially with guns. So chronic pain is a real issue. It affects everything, and, and it might have nothing to do with an, uh, may have nothing to do with a neurological issue, but it affects every part of your body, every system, and your, not only your quality of life, but how you interact with others. And again, the psychological aspect of pain, when I see a patient and I say, I really think you'd be it would be beneficial for you to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist and, and sit down and with someone, not a, a surgeon or your caregiver, not your family or friends, but someone totally objective who could listen to what you're saying and what you're experiencing and help you sort out that information and maybe rechannel some of the behavior that you're experiencing. and. and and uh, symptoms you're experiencing in a more positive, productive way. And they still go, go nuts and say, oh, are you crazy? You think I'm crazy? You know? and, uh, and it becomes very difficult because people associate a psychologist and psychiatrist with a disease or something terrible. And the truth is everybody who has pain has psychological reaction to pain. It's normal. And if they say, I'm not depressed, I'm not upset, I'm okay with the pain, then you know that, that they really do need a psychiatrist, not a psychologist. So um, it's very important. And of course, these are compounded in, in syringomyelia patients, for example, in Chiari patients. Very often, there's a minor trauma. And someone, I had one lady who was hit by a sausage in Kentucky. Someone threw a sausage at her in a factory of sausages, and she sort of jerked back and that was it. She caught it, and then she ended up suing workman's comp and suing the person because they caused her Chiari and, and, uh, 
and caused her sphingomyelia. Well, the truth is, guess what? She had no symptoms until that guy threw the sausage at her in a playful way, just, you know. But she did afterwards. So the law is very fuzzy in this. Even though she had pre-existing, it wasn't symptomatic. So legally, she became, for the rest of her life, a workman's comp case, and which totally, in, in many ways, uh, defeated any opportunity for her to get better. Because as long as she had pain, and she was disabled, even though she was no more disabled when she caught it, she would, she would never respond you know, to therapy or the opportunity to get back her life. So this, this is the reality show that we live. So you just have to be aware of it. If you're in an accident, you know, and you become aware of your Chiari and you have a neck injury, is it your fault that somebody T-boned you? You know, but is that, how does that tie into responsibility for your medical treatment? And I don't know, I think Dr. Jagged, who's there, looking with this pose, you know, the famous thinker, will tell us at the end of this lecture what the answer is. But, but it is, a, it's not easy. There's no doubt the family plays on it. You know, some people really enjoy the dependency and the, and the uh, treatment they get, which is different if they're in pain or disabled. So all of these things, and any surgeon or clinician, allied health professional or physician, who thinks that these things aren't important should go see a psychologist. So that's my advice. Endorphins, why is that important in Chiari and Sphingomyelia? Well, endorphins are a natural source of, of pain relief. Everybody makes these in, in, in many different sources. The adrenal gland is a major one. But um, endorphins are produced in response to stress or exercise or activity. And someone who is in pain has a reversal. They usually are depressed and apathetic and don't want to work out or exercise or be active. And so they don't have even the natural responses that other people have to pain. And so this is a very significant part of what happens when you, it's a cycle that occurs. And so the deconditioning of, of Chiari Sringomyelia patients is very detrimental. And so it's important as part of the approach as a consumer, as a healthcare provider, that we make sure that people spend time every day of their life being active. Take the steps instead of the elevators if you can. If, even if you can't walk rapidly, you can be in a stationary bike or a common bike. There, there are so many options, but, but one needs to look for these because if you lose this ability to stay active and stimulate your body, to produce natural, you know, combatants to pain, you lose a real edge on this. And we talked about behavior modification and all the things that are contributing to it. And there's a lot of different techniques um, from biofeedback to relaxation and hypnosis that are, can, some can be self-taught and self-employed, self-initiated, and others are done in sessions, and some people are suggestive and others aren't. So if someone isn't interested or doesn't believe in one of these techniques, it's almost impossible to be effective. So a lot of it is how much people want to get better, what their motivation is, and are they open-minded. Everything from music therapy, you know, millions of people suffer from ringing in their ears, for example, and they found if you sleep with headphones and you, and you adjust the volume correctly, you can overcome this because sensory input competes with each other. Music competes with pain because they go into the sensory system of the body. So there's a lot of different ways to divert and to modify pain. You just have to look and see what's available and be open-minded and realize that there are other solutions other than pills, which is the easy fix right now in this country. When I was a young man, my father was a pioneer in hypnotism. He lectured all over this country, and delivered babies, and did smoking classes while he had an old gold straight hanging out of his mouth. But he, um, he used to use me when I was a kid as uh, to demonstrate. So he'd bring me in the room when I was trying to study. He'd take a match and 
hold it under my hand, or he'd take a needle and put it through my hand, you know. And finally, one day, I learned about the children's rights. <laughs> so, unfortunately, I was in my 30s at the time. But that's a true story. Anyway, placebo is very important. And, and there's all types of placebos, from sugar pills to a lot of, of the way that people are handled and spoken to. And it's extraordinarily uh, a strong way to be able to help people. And everybody thinks, oh, placebo, they're trying to pull a fast one on me. But I think if you reconsider what the definition of placebo is, um, is there a way that you can modify someone's pain without hurting them and helping them? And is there a way where they don't necessarily have to have this shoved down their throat, but you can do it in such a way that it's a positive, whether it's a pill, whether it's a discussion, whether it's an intervention. It's very important to keep this concept in mind. And, and again, there are a lot of strong cultural issues and cognitive issues with placebo. And it, again, this is very important, is interpersonal communication skills between a surgeon and the patient or between a allied health professional or nurse and the patient. And, and, and between the patient and other people around the patient. Communications are so important. There's also at the other extreme, many surgical options. And surger, surgery for pain is something that used to be very common in my profession when I trained. And every week, my professors were making holes and lesions in the brain and the spinal cord and using electrical currents and knives to damage the nervous system. And the lesson from all those thousands of patients and many decades of experiences, usually the treatment was worse than the disease. And that was a different time. And today, we're doing less of this destructive stuff. And we're, taught, we're using now, um, and Dr. Jag is sitting here, we're using electrical current in the brain and spinal cord to try and modify the electrical circuits and behavior and the chemistry rather than destroy tissue to try and change pain. And I can't tell you how many hundreds of patients I've seen that were much worse off after invasive surgeries to lesion their spinal cord or brain with good intentions to make them better. And, uh, and so today we're looking at less destructive and more augmentative type uh, uh, procedures, and we'll talk about that. Now, are there any alternatives for pain control? As they used to tell me, does a bear have hair? Yep, there's a few alternatives. But as a physician, nurse, and allied health professional, we're allowed to prescribe things that work. So if I give you penicillin, and you've got a strep throat, I know there's a 98% chance you'll be cured. That's evidence-based medicine. If I give you acupuncture, or I say I want to give you a session of cranial sacral therapy or Tai Chi, you know, or hypnotism, none of those are evidence-based treatments. And they probably are very effective in 10, 15, 20% of patients. But because they're not evidence-based, you have to reach in your own pocket. And Americans culturally don't consider health something that is as, a, as important as the car you drive, the boat you have, the house you live in, the type of TV you watch. So it's amazing to me to see the whole mojo about where people value their health their happiness, their comfort. And so very uh, rarely are people willing to meet you, meet, reach in their own pocket when you say to them, well, this may work, but there's maybe a 20% or 15% chance it'll work. But it's not invasive, it can't hurt you, and it could help you. But that's not good enough for the insurance companies, the government, or most patients in this country. I think you'll find in other countries that i visited in Europe and elsewhere, people seem to be more interested in alternative treatments. And, um, and in some countries, like China, for example, people have a choice. 
They can either go to traditional Western medicines and have surgeries and pumps and stuff, or they can go to the traditional physicians and use herbs and other organic preparations and, and manipulations of types, uh, and it's their choice, and they can switch over if they're not happy with the path they chose. So you've all heard about some of these, like biofeedback and breathing therapies and all the different hydrotherapies, and again, these are very valuable. One of these, Pilates, at least in Chiari patients, and spinal surgery in non-surgery patients, I think is so effective that I'm hoping someday someone will do a study to show it's evidence-based. Because we used to take everybody with spine problems and over-flex them and stretch them and say, the more flexible, the better you are, stand on your head, all this kind of stuff. And now we know that building your core strength and uh, ferociously protecting your posture is really something valuable which Pilates accomplishes. So I'm a big fan. So you can have neuropathic pain without um, nociceptive pain. You can have them coincidental. And again, there can be more than one problem in a patient. But these definitions are very important. In general, if you ask me how do people describe neuropathic pain? Um, they describe it as burning, pins and needles, you know, tingling, um, vibrating, um, lancinating, and you can have nociceptive pain that's lancinating too. That's not necessarily neuropathic. But these are the types of pain and the way that people describe them that make you shift your diagnosis towards neuropathic pain. And it sure doesn't have to come from Chiari. You can just have diabetes and have a neuropathy, or you can just live in a place where there's toxic chemicals in the soil, or biologically, chemically altered food that we eat that can cause some of these signs and symptoms. There's no doubt about it. And hopefully we're waking up to a better world as far as that. So, allodynia is described as perception of pain from a non-painful stimuli. So, if, if I go up to you and I go like this, you know, and, and you shriek, you know, that's inappropriate. You shouldn't have pain from just barely touching. And some people consider that then the definition of allodynia, whereas hyperalgesia, which is used commonly, um, is someone who you pinch a little bit, but they scream instead of just pull their hand away. It's an overreaction. So all these have a little change in the definition, but it's very important to realize that most uh, neuropathic pains don't require a stimulus. You don't have to touch someone or squeeze something or bump someone. It's a spontaneous pain very often, and that differentiates it in many ways from nociceptive pain. So, what are some of the surgically treatable neuropathic pains? And I think one of the common ones that people talk about is the carpal tunnel, because it wakes you up at night with this terrible pain in your forearm and your hand, and burning and cramping and tingling. And it isn't present as much during the day. It's very common because of the way people use computers these days and the way their posture is and the way workstations are not intelligently placed. So that's an example, a simple outpatient procedure releasing the pressure from that nerve and people are cured. Sometimes immediately and sometimes over time the nerve will recover. So compressive radiculopathies, syringomyelia, very often when someone successfully treats it and it depends on it, we'll talk about the treatment in a few minutes, it's either you know, the best treatment we know today is to eliminate the cause. And when I was training, there was no knowledge of what the cause was, so we put shunts in everybody and drain them, and they would often fail and cause scar tissue and more problems, more scarring and tethering. But now we know that most cases of syringomyelia get better with a straightforward Chiari malformation, decompression, Chiari decompression, they go away. So tethered cord is another example of patients with neuropathic pain. 
at the area that the cord is stuck from tumor surgery, from other types of surgery, from meningitis, from infection, uh, from uh, trauma, wherever that cord is adherent, um, this is where the pain often is, but it can also be below that level. And uh, tethered cord syndrome is now much better understood, and it can be so post-surgical, post-trauma, you know, people, kids with meningitis as a child can develop it in syringomyelia. So there's so many different causes, but the treatment is the same. Reestablish the spinal fluid flow to normality, just like the Chiari decompression. Trigeminal neuralgias, another example, and reflex sympathetic dystrophy. I don't want to focus on those. Headache is a major problem with Chiari patients. And there's a lot of theories about it. But basically, it's a very simple concept. Spinal fluid is made inside the brain at a constant rate inside the ventricles or cavities in what's called the choroid plexus. And it circulates through and around the brain and around the spinal cord. Against gravity, it comes up over the top of the brain again and is absorbed in a filtration system called the arachnoid granulation. Anything that blocks this circulation can cause syringomyelia. And the latest theory is there are spaces in the spinal cord, Virco Robin spaces, which are openings inside the, in, inside the cord itself, that when the pressure changes in the spinal fluid flow, it becomes like a boulder in a river. So if normally the spinal fluid is produced, flows, is absorbed in a constant, if you look at it like a river, and you put a boulder in there, it creates eddy currents swirling. And that spinal fluid, instead of going right by the area, is absorbed into the area, and it can blow out and or, or enlarge from this fluid, and it can be caused, what's, it can create what's called a spinal cord cyst or syringomyelia. Others, uh, can be hydromyelia, can be direct pressure from the brain where there's hydrocephalus. Again, a blockage of the, of the release of the fluid from the brain where it doesn't circulate normal from infections, trauma, you know, meningitis, from uh, hemorrhage in, in babies. All these things, tumors, can cause blockage of flow. And sometimes, because of the altered dynamics, the fluid can be forced right from the brain into the spinal cord and enlarge it and cause the same entity. But the treatment, the best treatment we know now, is to recreate normal flow. And so it's very important um, that the headache, the treatment for a headache, the best treatment, if it is a Chiari headache, or if it is a, um, a syringomyelia related headache, or syringobulbia, which is fluid in the brainstem, is to try and reestablish that flow through untethering, through a shunt, diverting the fluid. There's other possibilities. Um, it's very important also to teach people who have these problems ways to avoid it. I'll give you an example. Um, you can't tell someone never to cough, but coughing uh, and is the same thing as when you strain, you're constipated, you're having a baby, you're in labor. It's called Valsalva and you put pressure, and it raises the pressure in your spinal fluid. <coughs> you know, you see people lifting weights. Instead of breathing like they're supposed to, with their mouth open, they hold their breath and they go <coughs> like that, and that's Valsalva, and it creates huge problems for people with Chiari or Syringomyelia because it changes the pressure and causes that pounding, terrible headache. And people often say, oh, it's, it's a spinal headache because it's often in the back, but it can radiate to the front, it can be on both sides, versus a migraine, which is almost always on one side. So, but it's a very disabling headache. And people with Chiari and with syringomyelia learn not to try and cough. When they laugh, the same thing can happen. They walk away if you're telling a joke, because they know it's going to hurt them if they start laughing. And so they also know being constipated raises the pressure, your intra-abdominal pressure, if your stomach's distended, and causes a valsalva. So these are all things that are, should be avoided. And we also teach people 
with these headaches to do things like, you know, alternatives like Pilates, because your posture and core strings help open up the circulation. And some people have found good relief with craniosacral therapy, which is again considered fringe medicine. It's an alternative. It's not FDA approved. It's not evidence-based. And what they do basically is they massage you at the base of your skull, where you have a big fluid collection, and down your sacrum, where you have another. And this is very effective in some people. Do I understand why or how? Has it ever been scientifically studied? No. So it's important to know what precipitates the headache, and often you can prevent it or you can modify it. So the best treatment is to eliminate the cause. My criteria is quality of life. Most people don't come in to me disabled or paralyzed. They come in and say they're miserable. Every day of their life, they get headaches and they get pain you know, their shoulders, their arms, numbness, tingling, you know, and I, I see if I can modify their behavior. I talk about the causes of their headaches and their pain, and I give them Pilates. A lot of people with Chiari, their posture, they're protecting, so they slump over. Their spine is bent forward, what we call kyphotic instead of lordotic, and they often get manipulated by a chiropractor who actually overstretches their neck so they're very loose and they develop spinal headaches, accentuating Chiari type headaches. So what I do is I usually use physical therapy, core strengthening, trunk stabilization, the opposite of yoga, isometrics to build their posture and core, and, I, and breathing exercises, you know, and if that doesn't work, you know, and I've tried anti-inflammatories and mild medications, we'll talk about that in a second, as surgery becomes not just the last resort, but a rational approach. But my criteria is that every day in your life, you are disabled or not functioning well because of your signs or symptoms. Not something once a week or once a month, you have a flare up, but it's gotta be something that interferes with your quality of life and your functional status every day. And then, again, I do the workup and talk about the pros, cons, alternatives, and risks. I'm gonna show you several cases of Chiari decompression so you'll understand uh, the surgical treatment, but it's simply reestablishing spinal fluid flow. Now, these are the types of non-surgical medications and probably the most effective are the antidepressants and anticonvulsants. Um, the antidepressants, the old standard was amitriptyline, Elevil, and the newer one that's, that's fashionable but not as well tolerated is Cymbalta. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it, but all of them have indications and contraindications. And you have to be very careful mixing medicines. It's called polypharmacy. But in my experience, to try and avoid surgery, a combination of one of those medicine from each of those classes, whether it's the non-generic Lyrica or the generic Neurotin or Gabapentin with a Amitriptyline or a Lexapro or a Cymbalta gives the best effect and patients aren't necessarily addicted or dependent on these medications. Um, there are other headache treatments specific like migraine treatments and more invasive things like nerve blocks and there's a lot of these clinics that are out there waiting to burn your nerves and do that kind of stuff. But the less invasive, the better. If you are going to invade someone's body, you should probably do the appropriate treatment at that point. Okay, there are surgical treatments for headaches like cutting the nerves but then people will complain the rest of their life, say, I can't feel when I brush my hair, I feel awful, I can't, you know, when I lie down. So every time you cut a nerve or burn a nerve, you create another problem. So anything that's invasive like that, destructive, is a trade-off. Now some people have instability of their spine uh, because of a disease like rheumatoid arthritis along with Chiari or Sphingomyelia or they have congenital weakness in the base of their skull and spine, 
the, the spine can telescope into the skull called basilar invagination or flatting the skull, platabasia. In those situations, often the Chiari surgery, the decompression should be associated with a stabilization, fusing the skull to the spine. So it's very important to be able to holistically evaluate and treat these patients so that you can potentially do this all in one day with one operation. Okay, what are the uh, generators of pain? And of course, syringomyelia, there's a lot of controversy why it's painful. Because there are thousands and thousands of people walking around with syringomyelia that don't know they have it. They get an MRI, they're in an accident, or they get a headache, and they say, oh my God, do you know that you've got syringomyelia? So we end up treating very few of those patients. So to have a cyst in your spinal cord doesn't mean you've got pain. And so this is a very um, challenging area of diagnosis and treatment. And very often these cysts or syrinxes are so small that the treatment can be very harmful. So we always look for reasons if someone does have a syrinx, and sometimes we can't find a reason, but very often they have what's called an arachnoid cyst or a, a scar tissue they were, or webs that they're born with that block the flow that you can't see on a regular MRI. And we, we uh, utilize tests called cine MRIs, which are motion pictures of the spinal fluid movement, which helps us to see disruptive flow and obstructions that if removed, instead of shunting the cyst, will allow the cyst to disappear. So it's a very important tool, and I believe the first software for Sydney MRI was developed by the neuroradiology team here at uh, University of Miami in Jackson. So what about salvage surgery? Unfortunately, there's cowboys in neurosurgery, like other types of surgery, and a lot of people don't treat conditions often, and they don't have the experience or the training to do the right thing the first time. And uh, so it's very important, just like you look for your car, or you look when you buy your house to get comps and similar real estate sales, that you look around before you choose someone to treat your Chiari or your Syringomyelia. Because very often, those of us in larger centers like this one that treat a lot of patients with Chiari and Syringomyelia are forced to be the second in. And it's always a lot safer and more effective to be, be there doing the surgery right the first time. So it's very important to look at people's background, their credentials, their training, see if the institute has a commitment to this problem and whether they've gotten experience, a volume experience with these patients. Because it, it makes a huge difference on how you end up. And so credibility is very important. And I want to also tell you that surgery isn't a simple fix. What percentage of people of Chiari surgery have complications? Is it 1%, is it 5%, is it 10%? I can tell you when we first did these using shunts, it was probably 20 or 30%. But now it's probably down under 5%. And is it 2% or 3%? It depends on what you're doing and the complexity of the surgery. It's low, but it's not zero. And one of the complications is needing further surgery, which isn't anybody's goal in the beginning, but it's realistically. And any of these things can occur, especially if your surgeon isn't experienced or isn't operating on you for the right reason and doing the right thing. So it's very important to place this as a very precious, important decision in your life, just as much as buying a car or a house and spend that much time getting other opinions and looking at other options. What about barriers to recovery? We talked about physical deconditioning. Alcohol and drug dependency is a huge barrier. You never hear of anybody as a recovered alcoholic or a recovered narcotics addict. They're always recovering. And so it's a very difficult challenge 
on top of having a Chiari or syringomyelia. Chronic depression is another area. Um, and patients with chronic pain uh, always have depression because that's a natural response to pain. So you have to holistically look at your patient and make sure that their pharmacological problem, whether it's alcohol or narcotics, their psychological problems, and their physical problems are all looked at holistically. Otherwise, you're going to fail if you only focus on one of those arms. They're all important towards success. So, what are some of the medicines that are less expensive and more effective? Probably the best one right now for neuropathic pain is Neurontin, which is generic gabapentin. Lyrica pregabalon has the advantage of being twice a day instead of at least three times a day because of the half-life of gabapentin, but it's not covered by many insurance companies. So most people don't use it for that reason. And I think they're equally effective. You know, but if you have a patient where compliance is a major issue, you're much more likely to have them take something twice a day when they wake up and go to sleep than if they have to take it during the day. And again, every one of these medicines, gabapentin, for example, Lyrica, cause retention of water, they can cause blood pressure problems, they can cause difficulty thinking, remembering, speaking, expressing yourself. Uh, Lyrica has a problem with glaucoma, it raises intraocular pressure. And if you read these complications, they really scare you and you say, I just want to go natural. But the truth is they give a tremendous amount of relief for people with neuropathic pain. And uh, again, there are, are probably 20 different medications, about half of them are shown here, that have been shown to be effective. If someone is obese and has an eating problem with weight, Topamax has an added side effect, not only helping neuropathic pain, but it decreases appetite, whereas gabapentin or Lyrica can be associated with increased appetite and weight gain. So all these things have to be weighed very carefully, and you have to have a good, open discussion with your patient about these medicines, and you have to be careful you don't mix them with medicines that can cause problems. Again, what we call polypharmacy. So, the anticonvulsants we talked about, some minor side effects, some major side effects. The antidepressants, the old standby, the simplest one is, is Elevil or amitriptyline. It's very effective in neuropathic pain, but people can stay up at night with restless legs. It can cause dryness in the mouth. You know, it can make people anxious, even though it's an antidepressant, but it is very effective and probably the cheapest of all the medications. At the other end of the scale is Cymbalta, which is an extraordinarily effective. It's the only antidepressant that's FDA approved for neuropathic pain, and there's no doubt it's helpful. But if you read the list of side effects, you probably want to go to Canada and avoid the draft. But, it's, <laughs> but the truth is it can be safe if it's managed effectively. And mixing two different antidepressants is also an issue. So you have to be very careful and make sure you're dealing with someone who knows how to deal with these medications. I have a colleague here who's a neurologist who sort of dedicated his career to these type of problems, uh, Alberto Martinez Arzala, and he's quite aware of this. So usually I let him handle the medical management because it takes a lot of time. You have to be very accessible and you have to really listen to people and care about them. Very important. So. These are some other alternatives. Anxiety is a major issue, and I have no problem using something like Xanax for anxiety rather than morphine or Oxycontin or what most of the pain doctors use. These are somewhat habit-forming, but to me, they're less dangerous um, than the narcotics. Some of the patches work very well on local neuropathic pain, uh, the anti-inflammatory or the lidoderm patch, but they all have side effects if not used properly. Okay, what about opioids? They don't work in neuropathic pain. And here's the problem. People come in my office and they say, I say, what's your problem? They say, I've got nine out of 10 pain. 
and sometimes it's 12 out of 10 on a 1 to 10 scale. I said, but you're on 200 milligrams of Oxycontin a day. And they, and, and they said, yeah, but I can drive and I can work. I said, what do you do? Well, I'm a fireman or I, or I, you know, a construction worker. I go up and telephone poles. Think about it. There's no way. There are millions of people in this country who are totally drugged out and are driving cars, motorcycles. Your children are crossing the street and these guys are fine because they can go to work. But their judgment, their, their reflexes, everything is so impaired. But these pain doctors write these massive amount of narcotics and they let them loose. They say, it's okay. They say, I'm working. I say, well, why are you here? They say, because I've got terrible pain. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's a real cancer in our society. And I don't know what the solution is, but it's something that we have to change. And uh, I guess it's like handguns until more people die every day. You know, this is going to keep happening. But it's very important to keep Chiari and Syringomyelia patients off of narcotics. They don't work, and they're addictive, depressive, constipating. You know, and they, they really create long-term problems that are often lead to tragic consequences. What are some of the alternatives? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, all the way from the old Motrin, Advil, Aleve, to Celebrex, which you can't take if you have a sulfa allergy, but it lasts 24 hours. Mobic lasts 24 hours. is generic, much cheaper than Celebrex. So that helps pain. It helps the associated pain more than the neuropathic pain. So if people have syringomyelia and weakness and they develop joint problems, neck, spine problems, arthritis, this is an adjunct with Neurontin or Lyrica and with Amitriptyline or Cymbalta is a very smart combination that makes sense. Non-narcotics such as Tylenol, they've got slow release now. Tramadol is sort of borderline, but it's a non-narcotic. It's potentiated with Tylenol. These are better alternatives than strong narcotics. And what about the future? In this building and many places around the world, people realize that the future of medications is grim. Don't tell your kids to buy stocks and pharmaceuticals because there's no doubt that cellular therapy will replace drugs because we'll be able to create almost all the different medications, drugs, or their behavior with cells that we'll be able to wake up and put to sleep. For example, in, in the slide you see up there, there are cells from the adrenal medulla that you can program, literally. So if you take a plain tunnel, they'll wake up and they'll let loose, they'll excrete endorphins, catecholamines, neurotrophins, chemicals that get rid of pain. And if you take a regular Tylenol for four hours, these cells will be awake and they'll be giving pain relief. And if you take an extended release, they'll be up for 12 hours. And so they can be put back down. So this is the future, to be able to control natural administration of natural pain relieving agents. And, and it's not so far off or so impossible. I'm going to quickly go through a couple of cases of Chiari malformation and, um, and let you see um, cases uh, where you actually um, see someone, let me get the pointer, with the diagnosis of Chiari that has, in this particular case, you see the tonsils are low, but it's not very tight looking. The cine showed an obstruction. Same one. No, this is another one, sorry. This is a 34-year-old with syringomyelia. And you can see in this case, the MRI doesn't show um, a huge blockage of this area, but when the cine was done, the tonsils could be seen going up and down, and they were actually blocking the flow, and you saw the pain diagram. And this, that patient improved with surgery. Some people, 
as a matter of fact, a significant number will come to one's office with a normal looking posterior fossa and have what's called tonsillar ectopia or a few millimeters of tonsillar group and are given the label Chiari, which is disabling psychologically to many patients because they go on the website and they begin to gather the signs and symptoms. So it's very important to be specific um, with this diagnosis. And this is a patient who, in this particular view, um, you can see this, is had, this patient's had a widening of this area. You see the tonsils are now wide, the flow is wide open. And this is the pain drawing with this patient who was totally disabled pre-op and two years just has some numbness and tingling and very little pain. And that's the goal of the surgery. Again, this is very common, motor vehicle accident, has nothing to do with the cause or creation of a Chiari, but it precipitates the symptoms. And this is a more classical looking MRI. You see the foramen magnum, the opening between the brain and the cervical spine, is totally filled with the patient's tonsils and brainstem, and they're compressed. Can you see that? This is a very classical Chiari malformation. You see how this is called the T1 image, where the spinal fluid is dark, T2 where the spinal fluid is light. And you see a blockage here. And post-op, you can see that this is wide open and the patient has all the symptoms of resolved. Now, everybody doesn't get that much better and don't send these little messages like this. But the fact is, the majority of people who have a bad Chiari, the one I showed you just now, have the best result. And the ones that have borderline Chiaris that maybe didn't need surgery in the first place may not have as good results. But this type of severe Chiari with blockage of flow is predictably someone who's going to be very happy in the future. Okay, this is another patient. And you can see that this patient has a complicated picture because not only is there a Chiari malformation and fluid, see the white in there and the dark in the center of the cord, syringomyelia, cervical thoracic, but also this patient has a congenital spinal stenosis, narrowing of the canal. So in this case, we not only did a Chiari decompression, but also what's called a laminoplasty and widen out the spinal canal and treat both entities which were contributing to the symptoms at the same time. Now this is what I was talking about earlier, how the um, internet can really give people, um, you can imagine someone walking in your office and this was the list of signs and symptoms this one patient filled out on the sheet. So I had to use the antidepressives for my staff as they were taking the history <laughs> over two or three days. But the fact is, this person picked up on almost every um, particular symptom. And you can see, again, a, a severe Chiari. The tonsils are way down into the cervical spine. And this patient, I'm sorry, had what's called basilar vagination the spine was sticking up into the, into the skull and it was all collapsed. You see all this area here. And it was flattening the brain stem as well as compressing the cord. And so this patient had a combination of an occipital cervical fusion along with a Chiari decompression and duroplasty with good results. This is just a patient that I operated on this week. And just to show you, a 21-year-old, and most patients are older, most adults, when they present with this, but you can see the severity of her cyst all the way up and down her cervical and halfway down her thoracic cord. And these were her main symptoms. And she couldn't cough or sneeze or run or do anything that young people do. And this was her surgery. And you can see that we coagulated the tonsils. These are the two tonsils. This is the brain stem. This is all the way down into her second cervical. 
and this is opening up the cerebellum, and this is the fourth ventricle. This is where the spinal fluid has to is created, along with the rest of the ventricular system, and it flows out. It has to flow freely. So once you do the decompression and you cut all the adhesions away, release the adhesions, and shrink the tonsils, you see this is normal cerebellum. These tonsils are like your own tonsils. You can eliminate them and they don't change your function. Once you do that, then you put a graft on. And we either use the material from someone's own scalp, which is called galia, or if the area is too large, like this patient was on Tuesday, we use uh, what's called alloderm, which is a form of artificial graft, which works very beautifully. And this patient should be getting out of bed tomorrow and hopefully home. And what will happen over the next weeks, we'll see further MRIs, and the syrinx will just collapse. And usually by three months, it's just a little slit. And the patient will recover and hopefully live happily ever after. So the more severe, the imaging, and the more severe the malformation, the more predictable, the better outcome. So what have we learned by doing thousands and thousands of patients in many different ways? We know that Chiari patients are all different. They're all unique. And some present at age 60, some at age 20, the adults. And some present with uh, syringomyelia, and some don't, and some have tethered cords where their spinal cord is pulled tight down to their lower spine and it creates part of the tonsillar prolapse. Some have a spinal fluid leak and they have what's called a secondary Chiari where the tonsils shrink down not because they were born with a Chiari but because it's due to an injury or another uh, failure to seal up the spinal fluid spaces. So we know it's very important to be diligent and be very selective on how you treat patients and who you treat. And again, it's more important to do it right the first time than almost any other disease. It's very important. And again, um, any surgery, no matter how good you are, may work or may not work. And all surgeries have complications. It's not like going to dinner and a movie. So it's very important as a surgeon that you communicate, that we communicate with our patients on every single case about the pros, cons, alternatives, and risks. And be very honest and transparent and be very accessible. Because Chiari patients aren't simple. They need to be able to talk to their doctor, to talk to the healthcare team that takes care of them. And that's a key to this whole area, especially in pain management. This concludes the first half of my discussion. <laughs> so, anybody that doesn't have a question? <laughs> no, any comments or questions? Yes. Well, the MRIs today are so good. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, if you have a, a shunt, how do you know if the cord's tethered? Because you can see on the, on the high quality MRIs available now, and Dr. Alper and his team are specialists in this area, whether there's free flow of spinal fluid around that area or not. So a shunt itself can cause a block. It causes a scar reaction. And, and the syringo subarachnoid is really a stent. No, that's fine, but I'm saying, we call it a shunt, but it's really a stent, like a coronary artery keeping open the inside to the outside so the spinal fluid doesn't accumulate. But sometimes these can cause scar tissue, the elastic tube, even though it's the size of a, of a toothpick, it can cause a reaction and cause, um, that's why as often as possible, we try not to use them, but sometimes we have to. Yes? Um, first of all, I applaud your recommendation of the glasses. It certainly helped me. 
Um, had a question. I didn't see Dymox up on the screen. I take Dymox. I was on Topamax, but it was causing me to have excessive hair loss. And um, so I was put on Dymox. Is that a, is that a, uh, a medication that you would also recommend? I don't usually for long-term use because it can cause imbalance of electrolytes and stuff. It's a diuretic. You know, um, and I'm not sure how effective it is long term, but if it's not broken, don't fix it. So if this is working for you, you know, but I would definitely check my electrolytes and my balance of my what's called the pH, the chemistry, because it is affected, you know, by that medication. Also, diuretics become less effective after a while, and you might find that um, that. If you wean down or off the Dymox, you might be okay. You might have passed through a certain phase, but I don't know. But it's surely not a narcotic or addicting or depressive. You just have to watch those things. Yes? What kind of patient do you find most uh, benefit advice involved in as an uh, initial addiction? Like, does there have to usually be a strong psychological or emotional component to the neuropathic pain, or is it Cymbalt is a little more expensive, it's not generic. So I'll always try a first line, like an amitriptyline or a Lexapro, which are gen generic, um, and probably have less side effects. But I find that if people fail at those, that um, Cymbalta seems to help people with uh, reactive depression from chronic pain, especially neuropathic pain. And there's evidence base that it does. But um, it's not a simple drug, and a lot of people don't tolerate it. They have much more uh, reported side effects. Uh, a lot of people just tell me, I, I, here's a bottle, I couldn't take it. So I take it to Haiti with me. But, um, but it's really a, a, an effective drug in many people. And I don't know how you know exactly what's going to work, but I always try the lowest level to start with. And Cymbalt is usually a step two. But, I find it very effective. We give 30 milligrams a day for a week, and then if they tolerate it, it's given in the morning. It keeps people up if it's taken at night. And then if they tolerate it, we give them the normal dose, which is 60 milligrams. And big people, like Dr. Jagged, you know, they, we give as much as 90 a day, like 60 in the morning, and, and some people go up to 120 a day, but I think it's approved up to 90 milligrams. Yes? Uh, Dr. Green, uh, are there times where you have patients... These are plants, by the way, in the audience. <laughs> is there a time where you talk about the quality of life, and usually it's people who have daily symptoms, but are there certain things on the imaging that might lead you to treat someone with an asymptomatic or incidental Chiari? Like, for example, someone may have the beginnings of a syrinx, but really, you know, it's more or less incidental, where you can treat them based on the imaging. Not, not um, an early syrinx, because I'd like to see them six months or a year later. And if I see the syrinx is growing, then I would electively treat them, because I can predict they're going to lose function or develop pain that could be prevented. Um, people used to ask me all that time with spinal cord injuries, paraplegic and quadriplegic came with these big cysts, but they had no pain. But um, they lost their uh, motor function, their tone in their lower extremities, which meant they atrophied more, they had more bed sores and other problems from that, even though it was painless, so I would treat those cysts. And I get a lot of criticism you know, from my colleagues saying, well, but they don't take care of people with bed sores and, and dislocations of hips and knees because of severe atrophy. So people with spasms often don't get that atrophy. So by treating those cysts, these people regain their spasms and their bladders would empty they could train their bowel and they wouldn't get the bed sores. So again, there's a lot of controversies and none of this is evidence-based. That's what we're hoping to do with the organization, do prospective studies, randomized studies, follow people surgically and medically and be able to sort all these things out. It's no longer a time when doctors can say, this is what you should do or this is what I know you should do or this is what works. You have to really sit back and say pros, cons, alternatives, and risks. And this is what we know, for example, what's evidence-based and what's not. Like I talked about the penicillin. 
versus the Tai Chi. Any other questions? Yes. Can I go back to his question about the Chiari Zero, where um, maybe the tonsils haven't herniated into the down through the foramen, but they're on it and and it's blocked the flow. Then that's that's really not that necessarily Chiari Zero. If the flow is blocked, it's a real Chiari. It's a Chiari. Yeah, because some people, as you saw, you know, have 15, 17, 19 millimeter prolapses down to almost C3, and other people have a six or seven, you know, but other people have a very full uh, tonsil, and it pegs them with the pulsation, with the breathing, with the heartbeat, it blocks the flow. So it depends on the dynamics. That's why we're past the stage of just measuring the tonsils. It's also a matter of doing the flow dynamics and correlating them with the patient's signs and symptoms. I don't know if you want to comment. Okay. No more cookies for you. What if the Pilates and trying to increase flow strength causes more symptoms? Yeah, usually it doesn't because part of Pilates is breathing and people who breathe better. That's what they, that's part of teaching Pilates is you know, they picture a flower that you open up. Don't do what I do, do what I say. But um, it's a matter, it usually lifts everything up and you breathe better. And that's a big problem with Chiari patients because in the they tend to close up like this. And so that's what's good about Pilates. Um, people who have um, spinal stenosis, who have what's called kyphosis, and whose spines are locked in sort of a flex position off balance, if you try and straighten them up, they have terrible pain. So that's why they walk forward like this. So that is an example of why Pilates wouldn't work on that patient unless you correct it. If their spine is stuck that way and they try and correct it with exercise, they're going to cause more back pain. So that's an example. People with stenosis of the cervical spine, like you saw, if you try and get them to be straight like this, they'll have more pain because it buckles the ligaments. So Pilates in general is amazingly effective. Pilates in specific cases can cause pain. Okay, well thank you everybody for coming here. We passed the sweet pasta. And uh, if anybody has any issues or questions, we. We, we do a very large volume, we're very committed to the patients, we do the basic research and we support organizations that, that have an optimism and an interest and investment in the future being better. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you.